For more than 80 years, the great Norwegian polar exploration ship Maud has been trapped in the ice in a remote bay of Canada's Northwest Passage, her glorious past frozen in time beneath the frigid Arctic waters she was designed to navigate. Today, a trio of passionate Norwegians have raised the ship as part of an epic attempt to bring her back home to the bay in Oslo Fjord where she was built. Cambridge Bay in winter. Temperatures drop to minus 40 degrees in the Arctic Circle, just 2,331 kilometers from the North Pole. The flat, white horizon stretches out for miles, empty except for the massive hull of the Arctic exploration ship Maud, resting atop the ice. Maud's story goes back a century. She was the creation of the great Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen, who spent most of his life venturing to the farthest reaches of the globe. He was the first man in history to sail the treacherous Northwest Passage linking the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, and the first person to reach both poles. He had lived with the Inuit for two years and learned crucial skills for surviving in the Arctic that would serve him well in 1911, when he became, famously, the first man to the South Pole. For nearly a century, Maud lay beneath the surface of these remote, frigid waters until she was lifted to the surface in the summer of 2016 by three ambitious and creative Norwegian men led by Jan Vangard, a former world windsurfing champion and artist. Vangard, Bjorn Miran and Stig Petersen hatched an unorthodox do-it-yourself plan to salvage Maud from the harshest conditions of the Arctic North. Six years later, they are finally preparing to bring her back home to Norway. Amundsen was a man who was very good at um, encouraging or to motivate people to, to join him on different kind of challenges. And, and uh, the Maud expedition was developed into a very uh, sophisticated scientific expedition. And today it's considered one of the most important um, scientific expeditions ever in the, in the polar region. If something doesn't work, you make it work, always. And Jan, he, if he has some, uh, what do you call it, resistant, it's something that doesn't work. He just put in more energy and uh, he, we always uh, come a little bit further. We never give up. Somebody has to take the initiative. And uh, if it has not been now, it might never have happened. While Amundsen returned from the South Pole expedition, a hero and in good health, his ship, the Fram, had dry rot and was no longer seaworthy. With his popularity at an all-time high and financiers ready to fund his trip, Amundsen set out to custom build a ship that could reach the North Pole. His plan was to let his ship be frozen in by the ice on the eastern side of the Siberian coast and drift with the ice across the polar basin. Here in Oslo, the Fram Museum holds the artifacts that Amundsen brought back from his polar expeditions, as well as the Fram itself. Amundsen decided to base his new ship on the same principles as the Fram. Throughout the Maud salvage project, Jan has come here for vital technical clues. They took the, they took the ideas from Fram and developed them to, uh, to a better uh, solution for the ice. And you can see it very well that it's a bit different from Fram, uh, from Maud. Uh, the, the shape of the hull is more like a V, v shape. And when uh, Maud was built, she was more, made more or less like a circle in the, in the section. So uh, that's very interesting for us to see. Norway became independent from Sweden in 1905, and the new king, Hakon, was married to Queen Maud 
the youngest daughter of the British king, Edward VII. Amundsen decided to name the ship after her, as his expeditions so contributed to the new Norwegian patriotic fervor. Construction began in 1916, here in Vorlen, a small town on the fjord south of Oslo. She was designed to be the strongest ship ever, capable of withstanding the crushing pressures of ice plates on the North Pole pressing against her hull. Amundsen hired the most talented shipbuilders of the time, Anker and Jensen, to draw up the first designs. The ship would need a special, rounded, bathtub shape and extra strength, but still be light so it could be pushed up rather than crushed by moving ice flows. It was decided to make the ship broader in the beam forward and narrower astern. The hull could have no cross timbers, but extra special attention would have to be paid to the joinings, shifts and fastenings. Three layers of oak planks were bolted together, with 12 by 12 frame timbers running from deck over keel to deck. Like its predecessor, the Fram, the Maud would have a retractable propeller that could be pulled up into the ship so as not to be damaged by shifting ice. They both had this quite smart uh, principle that you could lift, uh, lift the propeller and the rudder out up into the hull of the ship. And in this way, when they got frozen in the ice, there was no need for, uh, for the propeller and the rudder for maybe several years. So to protect them, because they were very vulnerable to the, to the movement of the ice, they could uh, pull them up and protect them from this. One year after construction began, the Maud was launched to great fanfares in June of 1917. Amundsen christened her not with champagne, but with a lump of ice. You are made for the ice. You shall spend your best years in the ice, and you shall do your work in the ice. With the permission of Her Majesty the Queen, I name you Maud. The house near Oslo, where Amundsen spent his Norway days, has been preserved as a museum. Among his belongings are a framed photo of Maud being launched. She would become his home for more than four years. She overwintered here in Oslo's main harbour and departed Norway July 1918 with the aim of lodging in the ice pack above the Bering Strait in order to drift across the Arctic Ocean. She had been equipped with scientific instruments from the Carnegie Institution, while renowned Bergen oceanographer Harald Sverdrup was the scientist in charge. The plan was to remain trapped in the ice to drift across the North Pole. During their first winter, frozen in Cape Chelyuskin, Amundsen suffered a series of setbacks. He was attacked by a polar bear, fell into the ice, and suffered from carbon monoxide poisoning. For two winters, the vessel was icebound off the Siberian coast with the men surviving on fish, seal and walrus hunted through the ice. They lived with the Chukchi Tundra people and used dog sledges to send crew members out, sometimes on 1,500 kilometer long trips, to telegraph stations on Dixon Island and Nome, Alaska, to send news of the expedition to the newspapers. Going on long uh, trips with this dog sledge, they were uh, very dependent on knowing uh, how far they were traveling. And by having this wheel hanging behind the sledge, they can, they can measure the distance. The, each revolution of the wheel uh, is counted on the little register box. So uh, after one day of dog sledging, they can know exactly how far they have traveled. In 1919, his fellow explorer, Oscar Wisting, described in his ship's diary the heavy ice pressure against the Maud. The ice cracked and crashed and rumbled, 
and the timbers of the moored groaned as the ship shook and trembled. In the hold, we could see how the props, beams and stanchions vibrated, but the moored suffered no serious damage. With the spring thaw, it appeared the ship would be keeled over. The dogs were shifted to the ice and the sleds packed with an evacuation imminent. But, true to her robust construction, Maud never succumbed to the ice. After forced returns to Nome, Alaska, and later for repairs in Seattle, in 1922, they were ready to make a new attempt to drift over the Arctic Ocean. This time, bringing on board a Curtis plane named Christine to be used for observation flights over the ice. Filmmaker, pilot, and scientist Odd Dahl joined the expedition and documented the wintering over and the first efforts to fly in the Arctic. But the plane crashed on just its second landing. This is a beautiful small model of um, Maud made by uh, one of the crew, uh, Odd Dahl, who was uh, very, very clever with building things. So it's very useful to look at the models when um, when you're going to prepare for a lifting operation. Although the scientific element of the expedition proved hugely successful, Maud failed to deliver the first crossing of the North Pole, despite spending six years in the ice flows. In 1925, the Maud and her crew were called back to Nome, Alaska to meet Amundsen's creditors. The Maud was sold to the Hudson Bay Company to pay off the explorer's debts. Amundsen eventually made the polar crossing in the Norga airship, but disappeared a few years later while flying a rescue mission in the Arctic. His correspondence, skis, snowshoes and other remnants from his life on the Maud were preserved and today are on display here at the Fram Museum of Polar Exploration. Uh, we have to remember that all through this time they did the scientific research. So that part of the expedition was successful and that, that's not what reaches the, the public because they want to know when Amundsen reaches the, reached the North Pole. So in this way he had a problem with promo promoting the project towards the investors. Uh, so in this way, the project was sort of double-sided. The Hudson Bay Company renamed the ship Bay Maud and sailed her to Cambridge Bay, where she sank in shallow waters in 1930. Soon after sinking, Maud's top decks were plundered away for firewood and scrap by the Hudson Bay Company and needy locals, leaving only a row of ragged timbers sticking up out of the ice like the skeleton of a whale. There was, this was uh, 1930, you know, the world was not uh, prosperous, it was hard times and uh, to actually bring this ship back to Norway never became a realistic uh, uh, wish, even though the ship ha played an important role in the Norwegian polar research and the Norwegian history and uh, the Amundsen story. In 1991, the municipality of Asker, Norway, approached the Hudson Bay Company about purchasing the Maud, which was sold for one Canadian dollar. But Aska never managed to bring the ship back. In autumn of 2010, the Tandberg brothers, three local developers, decided to save the Maud. A dream was born of repatriating the remains of the old polar ship and building a museum. The Tandbergs hired Jan, who had studied industrial design but had never done a ship salvage, much less a project this complex, with a shipwreck weighing several hundred tons deep in the frozen Northwest Passage. Naval architects and marine conservation specialists helped make structural calculations. Jan approached the salvage much like a polar expedition, 
with a settled crew that would follow the operation from beginning to end. Bjorn Miran is Jan's right-hand man, loyally by his side for more than 30 years. Yeah, uh, I know Jan for at least uh, 45 years. And when this project came on, he asked me to follow him because I always hanged around him, you know. And I might call me his left hand because he is left-handed. <laughs> they work by the Norwegian method, says Bjorn. They talk. They take the time it takes. They troubleshoot problems on their own. Jan arrived in Cambridge Bay in the summer of 2011 and first approached the Inuit elders and locals about the old shipwreck. They welcomed the Norwegians with traditional singing and drumming. Then he and an underwater photographer took their first dive to survey the ship. Above water, the moored looked in rough condition. But what Jan saw on his first dive beneath the frigid waters astonished him. Uh, but when I went down under the water, um, it's very close to the shore. There was a, a wall, uh, a massive wall meeting me. And it, you know, it's a big ship. It's uh, at least for a human being to meet it. It's very big and it was like uh, a little bit scary. I must admit the first times. The main deck, the oak hull, everything that was below the waterline had been amazingly preserved. And I had a knife and I knocked the knife into the wood and it, my, my knife bounced on the wood. You know, it was important. It was stone hard. But he immediately noticed another environmental aspect that would haunt him the next four summers. A layer of extremely fine river delta silt that with just a wave of the hand would swirl up around the ship, blocking visibility for hours until it had settled again. That month, Jan investigated every corner of the wreck and deemed the oak still strong enough to handle a salvage operation and be sailed home. And I started to swim around and I could see that this ship looks like a ship that was actually flo could float. Uh, so straight away I had the feeling that um, this, has been, this, this ship has been preserved by the nature uh, over all these years, even though uh, the ice has torn and worn it it was still uh, in very good condition. The team flew back to Norway and immediately began planning. They reapplied for the Canadian permit, which was at first rejected by a committee who felt the wreck should remain in place. The Norwegians appealed, pleading with the Canadians to consider the Maud's importance for Norwegian and polar exploration history. They presented a detailed plan for financing, salvage, and eventual placement in a museum in Vorland. They got the permit. It was clear the team would need to hire a barge and tug. Jan found a massive barge on sale online that had been intended for use on oil platforms. They bought it from Stat Oil and named it Jensen, after the man who built Maud. The barge would, however, need to be adapted in order to be able to carry the moored. It was fitted with steel crossbeams in a shipyard before being sailed back to Vorland, where more custom fittings would have to be made. Winter settled in at Munkesletten and there was little work to be done. Jan returned to Cambridge Bay in December to see the moored in winter conditions. He took an enormous risk and dived under the ice to see how she was faring. Outside, 
it was minus 40. They drilled holes in the ice for lights. There was a roof over us uh, and we saw that uh, the ship was framed in the ice and we had lights uh, through the ice so it was a beautiful view and it was more like um, something I will carry with me and also we, we could uh, photograph the situation uh, about the ice and give people an understanding of the, all the years that Maud has been laying there waiting for something to happen, I don't know. Jan also visited the Carnegie Institute to do more research on Amundsen's story and the history of the Maud. In the spring, Stig Pettersen heard about the ambitious plan to raise and return the Maud using the retrofitted barge. A construction worker and son of a fisherman from Lofoten, Pettersen also had no ship salvage experience. But he could keep almost anything running. The beat-up Volvo station wagon he drives has 600,000 kilometers on the clock and has never been in a repair shop. He was passionate about polar exploration and desperately wanted to come on board the expedition. I just asked him if he needed an extra man and uh, and uh, now he said he did not, uh, but uh, if I was interesting, I could uh, come out here and visit them. And uh, he heard that I was from Lofoten and he also has lived uh, many years in Lofoten, so we kind of find the tone. And, uh, and uh, I came out here visiting them and uh, helped them with the things on board. The Tandbergs bought a splendid Norwegian farm complex on the beach at Munkesletten near Wallen and made it the headquarters for the Maud Returns Home expedition. They also bought an old used tug and named it Tandberg Polar. As preparations were underway, Stig showed up every day, fixing this on the tug or adjusting that on the barge. There was much to be done to prepare both vessels for the Atlantic crossing, with all the equipment on board that would be needed once in Cambridge Bay. Like in the weekends, I came out here and uh, helped them, and uh, also in some evenings. Uh, and uh, then it just uh, became natural, and uh, one day Jan asked me if I wanted to uh, join them, and of course I wanted to join them. By summer 2014, the expedition was ready to go. The team would take the Tanberg Polar, towing the Jensen barge, with balloons, generators, air compressors, and all the equipment necessary to save the Maud. On Midsummer's night in 2014, the team set sail from Munkersletten, out from the Oslo Fjord and the coast of Norway, headed across the Atlantic Ocean. After 10 days of smooth sailing, they hit a hurricane force storm in the middle of the Atlantic. Oh, it was uh, pretty rough. And, uh, and uh, in the first, uh, we didn't know the tugboat, so it was a bit scary the first 24 hours just to know that the tugboat could take it. So, and it lasted for three or four days. Walls of green water shook their tug, which rose and fell in the massive seas. The barge was battered and lost some of its load. We had uh, what's, what's called the uh, green sea on the on the bridge uh, i guess what maybe five times and green sea then it's not good because then the windows can break and then you are you are not comfortable if if the sea breaks the windows on the bridge 10 meters over the surface after the storm, the crew assessed and repaired the damage. One of their best generators had been damaged, but both the tug and the barge had survived. 
In mid-July, the team passed Iceland and arrived in Nuuk, the capital of Greenland. There was still too much ice to pass through the Northwest Passage. They hunkered down for a month in Greenland, waiting for the ice breakup. On September the 7th, the Tanberg Polar and the Jensen arrived in Cambridge Bay. It was an enormous step forward, but ice would soon set in again. Jan flew a kite over the moor to get a bird's eye view. As the ice closed in around them, it became clear the lifting operation would have to be delayed for yet another summer. Jan flew the kite one last time over Maud, now frozen solid in the ice. On September the 27th, with snow and ice enveloping the bay, the team departed once again. Once the ice broke up around the Maud in the summer of 2015, the hard work on the lift could begin again. At the shore closest to Maud, the team created a base camp, equipped with an old green couch and the basic equipment needed for diving. Jan stayed in an apartment in Cambridge Bay, where he could sleep, eat, dry clothes and prepare for the gruelling schedule of two dives each day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Stig and Bjorn stayed on the Tanberg Polar, from which they would fish, giving them sustenance and something to trade with the locals. The technique the team planned to use was to take dozens of balloons out into the sea around Maud and fill them up with air so that they would lift the wreck from the sea floor. It was a tedious and tiring job. As the diver, Jan had the hardest job, working underwater in frigid temperatures to fix all the ropes and strap them around the moored and connect the balloons onto her sides. Bjorn adjusted and fixed the hoses and took care of general logistics for the team, while Stig kept the engines, generators and compressors running on the tug. Jan had his hands full underwater, where the airbags proved difficult to manage. Balloons kept popping up to the surface. It was hard to know where to tie the ropes. There were air leaks that Jan had to fix while underwater. Silt was easily stirred up, delaying the work. But the biggest problem was simple physics. The moored was waterlogged and heavier than they originally believed. The balloons did not seem to have enough lifting power to make her budge. The team was at a loss. They could not ship in additional balloons. But perhaps, they thought, they could make better use of what they had. They decided on a risky but innovative retrofitting solution. They would cut the balloons in half and use them vertically, like parachutes. We started to cut one airbag in two and make this parachute, but uh, we realized the same day that this was working extremely well. Uh, and then we could attach uh, the airbags very close together. And, and uh, we haven't seen these airbags being cut in two before, so we was a little bit curious if this was okay. But uh, after a few days we had cut more and more, and at the end we had more than 20 or 25 of these uh, these uh, parachutes and each sort of underwater parachute is filled with air and it lifts up uh, maybe three to four tons of uh, lifting power each bag. Amazingly, the balloons in their upright position had more lifting power. Then, all of a sudden, Jan noticed something different. It was a turning point in their whole adventure. Yeah, of course I'm, I'm up and down, and, uh, but basically we, I have to attach everything down the, under the water. So we attached uh, the front of the mod uh, with the, the strapping system underneath uh, and we started to, uh, to put pressure on her. 
and I saw that uh, this doesn't look familiar. It was some new, my eyes saw something new. And I just realized it had come up like 30 centimeters, uh, the whole keel. And I just then realized that the whole ship was actually uh, lifting, which is a big moment, of course. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it was like, okay, now it's happened. And uh, when I came up to the surface, uh, I also understood that uh, the other guys had seen it. I guess I was in, uh, in my very good sofa ashore because I have a very good view from there. But when I realized it was racing, I went out to the tugboat because I promised the guy to jump in to see if uh, when it raced. And it was a big moment, a really big moment. We had four years for it. I was standing uh, in the middle of the ship on the small raft um, and just steering the airflow to the balloons. And uh, yes, I could see it because the ship was uh, just a little underwater on the, just on the both the port and starboard side. So, so when it uh, wood came over the water, we know that it has happened. They were able to tilt the ship into an upright position. It was the first major step toward a successful salvage. The tilt was key to helping determine Maud's exact weight, but there would not be enough time to carry out the full lift. They would need more balloons, which they had begun calling vertical parachutes, and these would need to be ordered specially. It would mean another delay of yet another year. We had been there for a couple of months and uh, working very hard and realizing that uh, we are not going to lift more this summer, uh, but we, are, we have experienced what we need to know that it's going to happen. That winter, the team of three met to go over every detail of their plan, troubleshooting what could go wrong and making sure they were prepared for every possible repair. So, and the first summer was a very obvious uh, uh, trying and failing uh, process. And you can say that, okay, uh, maybe we should have understood more before, but it's so particular, this project, uh, and the, the way mode was pos positioned, and also the, the potential vulnerability of this ship. Uh, we feel good that we took the time to find out in detail how we should do it. The team ordered more balloons and additional high-tech, super light and super strong rope from China. Down at the boathouse, the team also kept a 1 to 20 scale model of the moored and barge, which they had built to test out in a variety of conditions. They would make little adaptations. Then Jan would kayak out into the frozen waters, trailing the barge and moored behind to see how she behaved in choppy seas. And the parachutes, uh, we call them parachutes later on, but they start as, as lifting bags. And we had the ropes, very strong ropes, uh, from um, uh, Hydema Spectra rope, which is as strong as wire, so it, and, but much lighter. These are very important elements. And then we, we have the air uh, compressors in, in the ship, and also we have uh, independent small compressors that can uh, produce air so we can fill the air bags and also fill the air tanks for my diving. Concerned about the state of the tug and the need to have all the generators and compressors working properly, Stig and Jan went to Cambridge Bay a month ahead, along with trusted mechanic Han Teye, who works in the Lofoten shipyard. I, I don't think you can have a better man for their purpose. So I, I have learned a lot. I'm really grateful to work with Harje. Um, I learned very much. To their dismay, after servicing, one of the generators refused to start. You have a lot of pressure on you because it was uh, 38 minus and uh, we, was, we could not uh, be without power for uh, a day then we will uh, break a lot of uh, the system on board. So, so even if it's not so very difficult, uh, 
it's, you, uh, you feel that it's more difficult when you have to make it in short time, otherwise it have big consequences. But the team was able to troubleshoot the generator repair and go back to Norway to wait for the ice breakup. Everything was ready to go. Well, uh, when we arrived uh, in June uh, 2016, we, we uh, had, uh, had the winter of uh, relaxing and, and thinking about what we had experienced. And uh, we felt good arriving in June and waiting for the ice to open. And around 1st first, first of July in 2016, the, the ice opens around the Maud and we could uh, access for diving and also start the operation of continuing where we stopped uh, last season. The ropes had been laid beneath the moor the summer before, and the balloons now had 150 to 200 tons of potential lifting power. All the balloons had to be refilled each morning, a process that took anywhere from 30 minutes to a few hours before Jan's dive would begin. It was a morning routine that involved checking and connecting the hoses, pumps, air compressors and multiple generators located on the barge, Tanberg Polar Tug and smaller rafts being used in the operation. We have the two big tanks uh, for starting air and this is the one we are using for uh, fill up all the balloons and uh, the, the compressor are big enough to um, to keep up the air pressure even if we use air all the time, we, can, we never run out of uh, air. Two, uh, two compressors yes. to um, load the start air. And then we have uh, two generators, this, these two ones. And then we have on the deck we have two uh, separate generators that we use for uh, in the winter, we use one of them to uh, heaten up the, the tug, to support the tug with the power. So we, it, one of these has actually been running for two years uh, over the winter, keeping the boat warm in 50 minus. Six cables connected the deck generators on the tug to the pumps on the barge. An additional small generator on the barge ran two very large pumps. Connecting all of this were 18 hoses carrying air to the balloons. The hoses could not get hung up on the boat. Losing a hose and risking the balloon filling with water was a risk they couldn't afford. There was no nearby mechanic or parts shop. Everything had to be repaired with what they had brought with them. Stig passed balloons to Jan and followed his position beneath the water from above the surface on a small raft, watching for the telltale bubbles that gave away Jan's position below, trying to guess what tool he might need, trying to anticipate any problems that could arise. So sometimes he, he disappeared for me. <laughs> so, uh, and it's a, it's a little boring because we have only one diver and you need to have control on where he is. Uh, mostly I knew what he was going to do, so I knew where, his, uh, where he was going to do work. And I tried to be there for, because he, it always happens something he needs, uh, some ropes or uh, air or anything. Finally, after a week of preparations and adding balloons, the team could feel there was beginning to be some movement. Stig moved to the middle of the raft over the moored to support Jan, who was swimming around the moored, topping up all their balloons with as much air as they could take. It had to happen. We had used all our buoyancy balloons and uh, uh, we have not space to put any more, so it, it felt like it has to, I mean, I mean, of course we could feel the, that mod was rolling from one side to the other when we was putting air on one side, it moved over. So we could feel that it could not be so very far away, but uh, we needed to have it from the seafloor, and so it's not enough to, to be close. 
So, so uh, when it finally came up, it uh, just felt uh, unreal. With her keel free, a whole new chapter of the salvage could begin. Raising the moored off the seafloor was the make or break moment of this salvage operation. At the end of July, we had, uh, we had put more or less everything we had of, uh, of airbags and uh, finally we had the lift of Maud. So the whole keel came uh, free from the, from the seabed so, and Maud was floating in the surface. She didn't show anything of herself uh, above the water, but uh, she was free uh, from the seabed so we could move her around as we want. And that was extremely useful because then we had uh, phase one sort of uh, done and then we can go move into to phase two and that involves uh, the barge Jensen that we had brought from Norway which um, is also going to be the one to, to be used for towing more back to Norway. And the barge uh, was then at the moment when we had more floating we, um, the next day we started to sink uh, the barge uh, down to the seabed. Freeing up the moored from the seabed marked the end of phase one of the salvage. Phase two would be submerging the barge and maneuvering the moored onto it in order to eventually lift her to the surface. And um, so it was actually standing on the seabed and we uh, could, yeah, I guess this shows best. Here you see Jensen floats and here she goes down to the seabed and lays on the seabed. And over the barge, uh, between the barge and the, and the surface of the water, there is space enough to, to, to maneuver Maud in a flo floating position, maneuver her over the barge, and then we can prepare for the lifting of the barge with Maud on top, which is uh, a simple operation, uh, technically, but uh, still uh, we hadn't seen it done before, so we were cautious about whatever could happen. Lifting the Maud out of the sea, however, presented considerable risks as no one really knew how solid her joints were or where the actual center of gravity of the ship was. But uh, basically we just started to lift the front of the Jensen uh, with the, the help of pumping the water out of the, of the inside of Jensen. So in this way giving her more buoyancy. And then she started to push uh, mold out of the water because Jensen has the potential uh, buoyancy when she's empty from water to carry mold in a floating position. As the team lifted the front of the Jensen by pumping water out of its chambers, the mold began to rise above the surface, to the delight of locals who began gathering at the shore to watch. However, Jan and his team had to keep the Jensen resting on the seabed to provide leverage and stability. As the more the moored rose out of the water, the higher her center of gravity became, and with it, the risk she could topple off the barge. Once in the shallows, the team could raise the moored out of the water and still have the barge under her resting on the seabed to give stability while they worked to free a century of debris from the wreck and stabilize it further. Then she could be raised fully out of the water. If, if we lift uh, Jensen up in the, in the back part, we could, it could be critical because then we will risk that it could tip over because the center of gravity is very high. So in this way, we, to avoid this risk, we, we, uh, we reduced the weight of Jensen on the seabed by pumping water out. And then when she came close to being neutral, we had uh, the opportunity to pull her slowly, but very close to the seabed, backwards into more shallow water. Once the moored was fully out of the water, the Tandberg brothers, who had sponsored the whole operation, arrived. The team hoisted the Maud's pennant. It was a triumph of tenacity and teamwork, 
a dream come true for the Tanbergs and the entire Maud Returns Home team, who had finally proven the naysayers wrong. It could be done. It had been done. And this worked basically uh, according to <laughs> over plan and, and it happened only in one week, one and a half week after months of fighting the airbag issue. Uh, we saw Maud coming up uh, and show her her uh, beauty. <laughs> and uh, it was a happy moment uh, for everybody. And, and uh, when she was up in the floating position, we could put the uh, old mode flag uh, up and, uh, and uh, have a little celebration. Yeah, the, the boat is very spectacular. The, all the, the colors are is the, the, the things that uh, make more most impression on me is, uh, is the, the special color on the boat, inside the boat, everywhere it is this glowing, when the sun is shining on it, it's fantastic. Uh. The Maud might have been raised, but the hard work was just beginning. She was full of debris, literally tons of mud and iron and steel. Amazingly, they found tools that had been used by Amundsen himself even storage boxes with his name emblazoned on the side. Every foray into the Maud brought new surprises, and by watching the historical footage of the Maud expedition, they recognized objects that were being rediscovered a century later, still amazingly preserved, frozen in time by the sub-zero Arctic environment. I'm very happy about uh, that the Tanberg the, took the initiative to uh, to save the ship. They came when the the boat was uh, half up, so uh, and they were staying for uh, two days, I think, two three days. Oh, it was great. They were uh, they were. Uh, very enthusiastic and uh, also they worked a lot when they was they was helping and uh, they were not afraid to uh, dig in the dirt and uh, do a physical job on the project that is also very nice in september 2016 the ice began to close in around the moored once again freezing her atop the barge for the winter the team returned to Aska to plan for the final phase, towing the moored slowly back to Norway via Russia. Our hope is to be able to return to Norway uh, the same way as Maud came, because Maud sailed uh, this way to the Bering Strait uh, before they wanted to do the drift over the North Pole. So, it would be interesting for us to sail the same waters as Maud uh, arrived. Thanks to a group of hardy Norwegians who dared to dream, Maud may finally return home from the Arctic ice that never managed to destroy her. And this time, she's coming home for good.